I'd like to welcome everyone to the Society of Skeletal Radiology uh, Resident Education Club webinar. Hey there, my name is Robert Butana from Stanford University, and I'll be serving as the moderator for this session. At this time, I'd like to invite everyone to sign in to Poll Everywhere for the fun, interactive portion of this presentation. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce your awesome speaker for this webinar, Dr. Haley Allen. Dr. Allen completed her radiology residency at the University of Wisconsin and her musculoskeletal imaging fellowship at the University of Utah. And currently she rules as the mm -hmm. director of MSK Imaging Fellowship at the University of Utah. And uh, we'll be talking about interesting knee cases. I couldn't be more excited, Dr. Allen. All right, am I muted? I can't actually see the control here. We've got Sounds you. Good. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, well, that's great. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I am so excited to be doing this. I've been a fan of the Resident Education Club since it started, and it was a real honor to be asked to do this and to talk about one of uh, my favorite things about my job, which is the knee. All right, um, no relevant disclosures. Um, so to break this up, um, we're going to be focusing on just a few main categories and then a little grab bag of miscellaneous cases at the end. Um, but our first sets of cases are going to be on sports and traumatic pathology, followed by some fun developmental cases. All right, so starting off with sports and trauma, hopefully everybody's gotten logged in to pull everywhere here. Um, so getting right into our first case. So this is a 25-year-old male skier presenting after a crash. So I'll just let these images kind of be here for a second, and then we'll get into our first question. All right, I am not seeing responses yet. I'm not sure if they're um, able to be coming in or if we are a little bit locked on our Poll Everywhere side. Let's see, I see. Give it a few minutes to see if folks start being able to respond. It looks like we're seeing an error with the uh, Poll Everywhere system right now. The responses aren't showing on the back end. I'll uh, adjust the screen share real quick. One moment. Thank you. A little extra long to stare at our case here. Ah, okay, you should be some. seeing the response now. Okay. And one moment while I give, yeah, and you've got control back. Okay, let's see. Okay, great. Awesome. So it looks like it won't show us all of our options at once, but I can kind of scroll through here. Um, so our options are meniscal root, parrot beak, bucket handle, and horizontal tear. And uh, bucket handle carries the day here. And uh, that is the correct answer. Uh, so this is a classic example of a bucket handle tear of the meniscus. Um, looking at what we can see on our images here. So you see this uniform hypo intense um, structure here, these uh, being the normal PCL. Uh, on both of our images. And then immediately anterior and inferior to that, we see a similar appearing hypo-intense kind of curvilinear structure. Uh, and that is our displaced bucket handle kind of sitting there in the intercondylar notch underneath our posterior cruciate ligament. Getting into uh, some info about bucket handle tears. Uh, this is one of my favorite findings uh, in the knee. Um, bucket handle tears are a kind of subtype of longitudinal tears, meaning the original tear occurs uh, in a plane uh, parallel to the outer rim of the meniscus. Uh, but in the case of bucket handle tears, that inner segment is free to rotate and flips into the intercondylar notch. These are more common at the medial meniscus, about seven times more frequently uh, on the medial side. Typically, the, the ideology is going to be some kind of traumatic injury, and there is an association with ACL tears. 
Um, these are pretty important clinically and, and important not to miss because they do require surgical reduction. Patients experience quite a bit of kind of locking and um, limited range of motion with these with that displaced um, bucket handle sitting in there. So um, getting these folks to see surgeons is pretty important. Um, the options for surgical treatment is repair if the meniscus is in good condition versus if that flip fragment is pretty beat up, degenerated, they may have to do a meniscectomy. Um, interestingly, the larger the bucket handle, the better the outcomes and the potential for repair, um, because the larger the bucket handle, that means that the tear occurs more closely to the periphery of the meniscus where the blood supply and the overall healing potential is better. So on this case, we're just going to kind of scroll through some images and just follow that displaced bucket handle. So this is far anterior on that medial side. You see this little kind of wiggle where the hinge of the bucket um, comes into continuity with the uh, more normally positioned anterior root. And then as we circle, um, kind of scroll posteriorly, you can see this beautiful piece of meniscus kind of displaced into the notch and then come back around and uh, reattach to that um, peripheral rim of the medial meniscus in the back there. Um, there are a bunch of named signs associated with a bucket handle um, meniscus tears. Uh, the one I just showed you is a double PCL sign associated with um, bucket handle tears on the medial side, where we see kind of twin structures in the intercondylar notch that look just like a PCL. Other named signs, um, so you can also see the double anterior horn sign um, here uh, on, a, on a bucket handle tear of the lateral meniscus, where that inner fragment flips into the notch uh, and basically forms an, a little triangle sitting right next to the more normal anterior horn, forming what looks like kind of twin anterior horns. Uh, another kind of associated sign is the flipped meniscus sign. This is um, a little bit of a variant. This is one that kind of posterior bucket part of the, of the tear is actually detached and is able to flip anteriorly. And so what you see is this kind of connected um, extra large piece of what looks like anterior um, horn of the lateral meniscus called the flipped meniscus sign. Sometimes I've seen it called a double delta sign too. All right, um, bucket handle tears, like I said, they're pretty important to not miss um, given the, the need for surgical treatment. Um, some clues to, uh, in terms of approaching your knee MRI and make sure you're not gonna miss this, is um, just look for the missing meniscus. And by that, I mean, um, get a sense of what the normal meniscal volume should look like on the medial and lateral side. So on the medial side, a normal posterior horn, which this is, should be about two times the size and volume of the anterior horn. And so if you're looking at a posterior horn um, that looks really small, maybe blunted on its edge, um, this is a nice clue that perchance you're looking at something like a bucket handle tear or another displaced flap tear. Um, for our lateral meniscus, um, as we know, it should form a normal appearing kind of bow tie configuration with the anterior horn and posterior horn being more symmetric in size. Uh, and as you scroll from, um, from peripheral to central, you should see that bow tie appearance on um, really two slices. If all you're seeing it is on one slice um, with a bow tie configuration, you may be looking at the so-called absent bow tie sign, uh, which is the clue that that kind of inner free edge of the meniscus is displaced and what you actually have is a bucket handle tear. All right, moving on to our second case. So another meniscal case. This is a 55 year old woman who slipped on ice kind of a range of um, MR images here. And again, we're focusing on the menisci, in this case, the medial meniscus again. And okay, great. And we're, we're in business here with pull everywhere. So that's good. So uh, the question is, what type of meniscal tear is this? So I have meniscal root tear, parrot beak, bucket handle tear, and horizontal tear again. And people are loving the meniscal root tear as an option. Seeing a few other answers. Okay, all right, unanimous for meniscal root tear. Perfect, so this is a case of a meniscal root tear. Uh, our MR findings here, so if we start on the left with this coronal image, um, you can see the posterior horn of the medial meniscus looks truncated and a little bit displaced. We don't see that kind of flattened out um, appearance of the posterior root ligament attaching cleanly onto that tibia. Um, same, uh, location, but on a sagittal image, you see an, no, basically no uh, meniscal tissue in place uh, at the same slice where we're seeing the posterior cruciate ligament. So we should be seeing a root here, and we just sort of see empty space, kind of high T2 signal um, where we would expect to see that root. I uh, I personally love looking at meniscal pathology on axial images. I think it's uh, it's an underrated plane um, for assessing meniscal pathology, but it's gr it's really great for root tears. So if we compare this case 
um, to the normal lateral side, we can see that posterior um, root attachment and, and horn of the lateral meniscus kind of come in and very cleanly attach them to the tibia. And again, on our medial side, all we see is open space. Some associated findings, we also have extrusion, medial extrusion of our medial meniscus, kind of beyond three millimeters um, uh, with respect to that joint line. So a kind of a secondary sign that we've lost hoop strength in that meniscus and that uh, meniscus is free to extrude. All right, um, I just wanted to include a picture from uh, Gray's Anatomy, just kind of showing a top-down appearance of what those normal meniscal root attachments look like. You can see kind of our C-shaped menisci, and then posteriorly, um, we get more kind of linear striated appearance of both posterior root attachments. Uh, root tears uh, can be traumatic or degenerative. Um, they are associated with the ghost meniscus sign, which is this appearance on the sagittal images where you're kind of scrolling through, you see meniscus, and then all of a sudden, boom, it's gone. You just have empty space. Um, like I mentioned, that, that loss of hoop strength of our meniscus results in extrusion. Um, don't forget the axials. It's a wonderful plan for root tears in particular, but meniscus in general. Um, it used to be that folks with meniscal root tears really only had the option, surgical options for meniscectomy. Uh, but nowadays there are um, some additional options to potentially repair um, meniscal root tears, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, in my experience, I would say these are the tears that are most commonly missed by residents. And so um, for the residents in the crowd, um, if you always, you know, before you close uh, a knee MRI, just take a second look to run through those uh, root attachments posteriorly um, and increase your likelihood of catching one of these. It's always, um, I, I always get a thrill when one of our residents actually I mean, makes this diagnosis and, and accurately calls a root tear. All right, next case. So this is a gymnast who fell during practice. We have a couple of sagittal MR images here. And the question here is, what is the mechanism of this injury pattern? All right, seeing some, some shifting confidence here. Great, thanks everyone for participating in the, in the response thing. This is a lot of fun for me. All right, um, so a majority is interested in this hyperextension option. This is the correct answer. This is a case of a hyperextension injury. Uh, so what are our MRI findings here? So on this first sagittal image, you see um, sort of kissing contusions along the anterior femur and tibia, um, where the basically the tibia and femur have banged into each other. A um, little bit closer to midline, we have that posterior cruciate ligament. Distally, it looks pretty good, but its femoral attachment of the PCL is kind of indistinct. It's a little bit, maybe some disrupted fibers and too hyper intense. So um, this was a partial tear of the posterior cruciate ligament. Uh, and then this is another image kind of more on the medial side where you can see focal disruption of that posterior knee joint capsule uh, with extravate extravasating fluid into the posterior um, kind of popliteal fossa. So all findings associated with knee hyperextension. Um, we kind of mentioned this, that reciprocal pattern um, of contusions uh, along the anterior uh, femur and tibia. Uh, PCL injuries are common. It can be a tear or a bony avulsion of the PCL as well. Uh, and injuries to the, the muscle tissues in the posterior capsule can also be seen. Um, a lot of times our posterior cruciate ligament tears, even complete tears, are treated um, conservatively, meaning we don't surgically reconstruct or repair them. Uh, some exceptions to that are if there is an avulsion fracture, particularly one that's displaced, or if the knee is frankly unstable. All right, another case, another mechanism case. So this is a snowboarder who had an injury. And our question here is, what is the mechanism of this injury pattern? And this, I feel like, is pretty well represented on in-training exams and board exams. It's one of those things you can show a single image and, and ask a multiple choice question. So pretty high yield in terms of, of testing. And it looks like most people are kind of honing in on, on the correct answer again, which is transient patellar dislocation. So what are our MRI findings here? Um, so we have, uh, again, kissing contusions are kind of reciprocal contusions showing where our osseous structures have banged into one another. So we have a contusion and actually a little minimally displaced fracture uh, associated with the medial patella, uh, and then another osseous contusion involving that anterolateral femoral condyle. 
You can see here, this is the uh, medial patellofemoral ligament. Uh, it's kind of partially injured um, along with this little displaced fragment, and then it's attenuated as we go over to the um, femoral side with fluid and edema kind of superficial um, and deep to those ligament fibers. So this is a classic uh, case of transient lateral patellar dislocation. Uh, a mechanism is um, somebody who's got a mildly flexed knee who then gets a twisting injury. Uh, the classic contusion pattern, like I said, very high yield for uh, board exams and hot seat conferences and things like that. Um, fractures and patellar chondral injuries are common, although tro uh, femoral trochlear injuries are pretty, you know, significantly less common. Uh, injuries to our soft tissue stabilizers of the anterior knee are um, very commonly seen in this injury. So our medial patellofemoral ligament is often torn. We can have injuries to that medial retinaculum as well. Risk factors for dislocation, so folks with just sort of underlying uh, trochlear dysplasia, patella alta, or a more lateralized tibial tuberosity are at higher risk. Uh, and then unfortunately, 50% um, of people who dislocate their knees in this way will dislocate again. So a lot of times when these folks are seen by surgeons, we're not only um, repairing the medial patellofemoral ligament, but we're trying to take some uh, some steps to try to minimize the odds that they're going to dislocate again. So things like a lateral retinocular release or a um, tibial, tuberal oste uh, uh, tibial tubercle osteotomy are pretty common here. All right. Um, I just wanted to include this little image of those soft tissue stabilizers of the medial knee. So our medial patellofemoral ligament are our transversely oriented fibers connecting the patella and the medial femoral condyle with the retinaculum being those more obliquely oriented fibers coming in towards the tibia and to the medial uh, collateral ligament. All right, next sports case. So this is a um, female who's a runner and a skier who comes in with uh, more chronic worsening knee pain. So two MR images here. And my question is, which structure is abnormal? Sorry, I can't show all four answers at once. I have to just kind of scroll up and down a little bit for you. All right, great. Um, so uh, this is a case of iliotibial band friction syndrome and our abnormal structural is in fact that iliotibial band. It's always a little bit tricky when you're not able to scroll kind of distinguishing which side uh, of the knee you're looking at is medial versus lateral. If you're looking at an axial image, I always suggest trying to find those pisanserine tendons. Uh, and that's, of course, going to be on the medial side. And then your opposite side from that will be lateral. So this is this is the anterior most um, structure that we see attaching onto the tibia on the lateral side. This is that iliotibial band. Um, our osseous attachment for this structure is Gerdes tubercle. So this little part of the tibia is where IT band attaches called Gerdes tubercle. Our normal iliotibial band um, is usually a lot thinner than this, kind of uniformly hypo intense. Um, without all of this surrounding kind of bone and soft tissue edema that we're seeing on this case. The coronal image here shows a little bit of thickening and kind of abnormal signal intensity of that iliotibial band at its distal aspect, and then this kind of rip-roaring surrounding um, edema signal. A couple more points about IT band friction syndrome. So this, of course, is just a chronic um, uh, friction-related condition. Uh, where we have irritation of the fat and soft tissues around that iliotibial band. It's usually our distance athletes, so classically runners, but also cyclists and skiers can also have this. Um, a lot of times this is a clinical diagnosis. We don't necessarily need uh, advanced imaging to, to make this diagnosis, but sometimes patients can be a little bit um, more complicated in their presentation, and they may be worried about concurrent meniscal pathology, which was the case in this patient. Uh, the management is typically just going to be rest from whatever activity exacerbates their symptoms. Physical therapy can help some NSAIDs and sometimes um, steroid injections as well. Um, one important kind of differential consideration here I wanted to include is that uh, enthesitis or inflammation of a tendon or ligamentous attachment related to an inflammatory arthropathy can have a very similar MR appearance. And so um, you know, where, where we have irritated soft tissues and bone um, around where either a tendon or a ligament attaches. So at those entheses in patients with ankylosing spondylitis or psoriatic arthropathy, um, we can see inflammatory changes in those sites. And the best way to distinguish that um, on an imaging basis is really just to get that clinical history. So you're talking about an athlete um, with pain with their activities and iliotibial band friction syndrome is going to be the case here. Um, 
versus somebody maybe with HLA B27 positivity and skin findings um, would maybe go more that uh, that inflammatory enthesitis uh, pathway. All right, um, this is a tricky case. Uh, so this is a 12 year old girl who was in a motor vehicle collision. Uh, I'm going to walk through the uh, the radiographic findings first and then show you some MR images and we'll do the multiple choice question after that. Uh, okay, so on our AP uh, image of the knee, we can see along the medial femoral condyle, we have a little bit of periosteal reaction and even some cortical disruption. So this is a Salter-Harris type 2 fracture of that distal, um, distal femoral metaphysis. On the lateral view, we see a little bit of widening of our posterior physis, uh, and then we also have a joint effusion. So this patient went on to get an MRI, and um, this is one of those images where uh, we want you to just click on the abnormality. All right, this is great. I'm seeing lots of green dots. Only a couple more seconds here. Looks like we're having a, a couple of different spots, but one main one. All right, let's go ahead and, and keep moving forward. So um, the, the finding of interest was here in that posterior physis. And this is a case of periosteal entrapment. So this is the image I just showed you. And what we saw was this hypo-intense kind of folded up structure sitting in that posterior uh, physis in the lateral aspect of the distal femur. This is the, the corresponding T2 fat set uh, image here. You can see, again, this hypo-intense structure here within the physis, a bunch of surrounding bone marrow edema, fluid in the physis, and then that joint effusion as well, which I think I've kind of marked all of those things. Um, so what is this black structure? So this is the displaced periosteum. We can actually see the gap where our periosteum used to be when this patient was in their motor vehicle collision and had their Salter-Harris type 2 from fracture, um, they disrupted the physis and, and, and ripped through their periosteum, which was able to then kind of interpose within the physis. This is what it looks like on a coronal image. So this kind of characteristic hypo-intense line sitting there in the physis. And then I love how this looks on um, oh, this, this arrow here is just to point out there's that Salter 2 fracture we could see on the radiographs. The axials are, are really beautiful in this case. We can see exactly where that absent piece of periosteum is. Uh, and then a nice good sized kind of soft tissue hematoma directly behind it. All right, um, so a couple of things about this diagnosis. So we know that the periosteum in children is very vascular and is loosely attached, which is uh, why it is possible to just rip off a huge piece of periosteum like this. And then in open physis, we can, um, can launch that stripped periosteum into that space um, in the setting of a fracture. The, the radiographic findings that are supposed to clue you into the possibility of this as a diagnosis is that persistent physial widening. Um, if maybe the fracture was displaced, they required a reduction, and you're just not able to get an anatomic reduction of the posterior physis, that should be a clue that the patient needs to go ahead and get an MRI to see if there is something like periosteum entrapped in the physis that's limiting um, that reduction. Um, again, we're looking for that kind of characteristic hypo-intense signal. The most common locations where we see this injury are about the knee, but we can also see it in the distal tibia. I've seen it in the humerus. Um, and it has some potential ramifications, particularly for younger kids. Uh, so the periosteum's role in fracture healing is to, um, is to create new bone and to heal our fractures. And so when you have periosteum within the physis, uh, what can happen is accelerated or asymmetric closure of that physis. So that can result in limb length discrepancies or alignment abnormalities like genu varum or genu valgus, um, which can be a big problem. And so ideally we want to make this diagnosis in a timely uh, manner within you know, no more than a week, ideally within a few days of the original injury so that the patient can get surgery and they can basically reduce that periosteum out of the physis. All right, moving on to our developmental variant cases. So this is our case one. I'll let you kind of take a look at these images and go on to our image. Um, what we want you to do is click on the developmental variant here. <laughs> love it. I love that a few people just kind of try something different. I appreciate that. It's always good to take risks. 
Okay, great. We will close this. Um, so in this case, the abnormality was this finding uh, here in the medial knee. And this is a uh, an example of a discoid meniscus. I'm sorry, this is a lateral knee. Um, uh, a discoid meniscus is a developmental variant. It's very common uh, where we no longer have that normal C shape of the meniscus, but instead the meniscus looks basically like a pancake or a big slab. Um, they're more common on the lateral side. Uh, the kind of diagnostic criteria that we're looking for is the, that meniscal body segment measuring more than 15 millimeters in width. 15 millimeters is pretty wide. We can have uh, incomplete or sort of partial discoid menisci that are a little bit less, you know, less than that 15 millimeters um, and don't extend quite as far across the medial compartment. Um, to diagnose this, uh, on the lateral side, what we would be seeing is a bow tie appearance of the lateral meniscus on more than three sagittal slices. So we talked about how normally we expect that on two slices. If we're seeing it on more than three, that's when we're starting to think about discoid menisci. Uh, and they are prone to early degeneration and tearing. Um, this is some scrollable images here just to kind of show this case. So lateral meniscus, we're starting at the periphery, we get that bow tie shape. As we start to march towards the intercondral or notch, we're seeing bow tie after bow tie after bow tie. So this is too many bow ties in this discoid meniscus. Um, this is a arth arthroscopic picture of this patient. I love this. Uh, you know, you're used to sort of seeing these like dainty little free edges of normal menisci on arthroscopy, and this thing really just does look like a great big pancake. You can see a little bit of degeneration of the free edge hair, but uh, but not any um, big high grade tears. When surgeons do go in and see these and they're worried about tearing, um, they can do a procedure called saucerization, which is where they sort of bite away that kind of inner segment of the meniscus and try to restore a little bit of a more normal shape. All right, developmental case two. So a couple of sagittal images. And the question is to name this finding. I do not know if this is gonna. Like it, there we go. Okay, sweet. Okay, great. So I'm able to scroll through our images. So I have a meniscal plinth, the meniscal flounce, a meniscal oscal, and a meniscal pleat. And uh, most people are interested in this option of meniscal flounce, which is the right answer. I admit, I just made up meniscal pleat and meniscal plinth. <laughs> Uh, so what is a meniscal flounce? So it's not really a developmental uh, finding, so to speak, but it is sort of a normal finding that we can see on MRI. Uh, so it is caused by a little bit of transient distortion of the free edge that we see on sagittal images. Um, it can be pretty common, up to 5% incidence reported. We see it as this cute little kind of crenulated margin of um, the meniscus on the sagittal images. And then as you're scrolling through your coronals, you don't see any abnormalities there. No free edge tears, no fraying, anything like that. Uh, most commonly, this is going to be on the medial side, although here's a little case of uh, meniscal flounce on the lateral side, and it's thought to be positional. So I read I read a study where they took patients who were found to have a meniscal flounce, they took them out of the scanner, um, put them back in the scanner, imaged in a different position. So rather than mild flexion, they were imaged in maybe a neutral position or a little bit hyperextended, and their uh, flounce is resolved. It's just a fun finding. There's not any sort of pathology associated with these. Um, it's just uh, a very cute appearance of the meniscus. All right, um, here we're getting into our developmental case three. Uh, so this is a tricky case. I'm only giving you one axial image. We'll have you click on the developmental variant. Let's see if this is gonna let us, there we go, okay. <laughs> You know, the more green things that kind of pop up in here, the harder it is to actually see the, uh, see what's going on. All right, great. So people are looking at that intercondylar notch. Excellent. Um, so this is a case of an oblique menisco menisco ligament. So the finding here I've outlined in these pink arrows. So this is this hypo-intense linear structure kind of forming a crisscross across the um, intercondylar notch, in this case, going from medial anteriorly to lateral posteriorly. Um, this is, we're going to just kind of follow it through on coronal images. So um, we're starting at the posterior aspect of the knee, so we'll focus on this kind of posterior horn of the lateral meniscus. 
and we're following this little structure here. You can see it kind of traverses the intercondylar notch before joining onto that um, anterior aspect of the medial meniscus. Uh, so this is a fun variant. Uh, it basically attaches the anterior horn of one meniscus to the posterior horn of the other meniscus. It can happen on either side, but they are named for their anterior attachments. So this is a medial oblique meniscal meniscal ligament um, named because anteriorly it attaches to the medial side. Um, it doesn't have any sort of clinical relevance, but the main thing here is just to not uh, mistake this finding for um, some kind of pathology. So we don't want to be calling these bucket handle tears, meniscal flaps, ACL tears, anything like that. All right, another developmental case. <laughs> All right, very cool, lots of ideas here. Excellent. So we'll move it on here. So this is an anteromedial meniscofemoral ligament. Um, I have some arrows here showing this finding. So it's this uh, hypo-intense linear structure that's kind of paralleling the course of the ACL, sitting in the intercondylar notch, just right anterior to the ACL. Um, when I first learned these, it was uh, we were predominantly calling them anomalous insertion of the medial meniscus, or AIMM, uh, and that's how in our report search tools and even in operative reports and things like that, um, our surgeons and most of our radiologists are, are calling the, them this because this finding comes right off of the anterior horn of the medial meniscus in most cases, and then kind of extends again parallel to the ACL and to the intercondylar notch. Um, now it's more commonly called, or I guess should be more correctly termed, the anteromedial meniscofemoral ligament. I've heard even a few other names, but this is, this is the one that, um, uh, that I think makes the most sense uh, in terms of naming. So it doesn't always come right off of the anterior horn of the medial meniscus. Sometimes it actually arises from that transverse intermeniscal ligament we can see along the anterior aspect of the intercondylar notch. Uh, and on a histologic basis, uh, it is a ligamentous structure rather than a meniscal one. It's pretty uncommon, so it's less than 1% incidence uh, and is asymptomatic. Again, this is just a, uh, a finding not to misinterpret for some potential pathology. So we don't want to be thinking you know, about partial ACL tears or meniscal flaps or anything like that. And this patient went on to arthroscopy for a different uh, reason, but they got a cute picture uh, during the, uh, the arthroscopy of this finding. So this this little kind of skinny slip of tissue coursing anterior to that, uh, that normal ACL there. All right, case five. So this is a 38-year-old with right lower extremity claudication. We'll have you click on the abnormality. It's a tough case. All right. Um, so I see a lot of um, little dots kind of focused on our what is our popliteal vein, but most of our responses are focusing on this kind of popliteal neurovascular bundle, um, which is the area of interest. Um, I'll show you this um, on an annotated image. So this is a case of an accessory third head of the medial gastrocnemius. Uh, and so what we're he what we're seeing here in this popliteal faucet, we can see the vein, which is kind of big, a little bit oval shaped tends to be a little bit bright. Uh, and then the popliteal artery, which is round and small and has this, um, this kind of pronounced flow void. And in a normal uh, knee, those two structures would be sitting really right next to each other. And in this case, what we have is this muscle kind of sitting in between those two structures. That is not a normal finding. There should not be anything sitting in between um, the vein and the artery here. If we followed this up, we would be able to see this kind of glom onto that uh, uh, medial head of the gastrocnemius, which makes this an accessory third head. Variant muscles in the knee are very common. Uh, they can have a variable relationship with the popliteal vessels. And if the, the muscle variant just sits posterior to the vessels, um, they tend not to have any sort of clinical manifestations. It's just a fun thing to kind of notice while you're looking through your knees. 
Um, however, if you see one that is either like this, kind of splitting the artery in vein or encircling the artery in vein along its anterior aspect, um, that can be potentially problematic and can cause something called popliteal entrapment syndrome. Uh, popliteal entrapment syndrome is something we see typically in younger patients, more common in men, uh, and the clinical presentation is claudication, so pain that's worse with activity. They may have kind of numbness and tingling in their lower extremity, uh, and there are some potential kind of more serious complications that can come with that as well, including thrombosis of the vessels uh, and even arterial aneurysms. Now, in patients where uh, maybe they just underwent a routine knee MRI and you see one of these muscle variants that has a potential to cause popliteal entrapment, uh, you can suggest that in your report and say, you know, if, if clinically warranted, we can do some further evaluation with MRA. So we can do a, an MR angiogram with stress maneuvers. What, what I mean by that is while they're in the scanner, we actually have the patient's um, do sustained plantar flexion or dorsiflexion to see if there's any sort of compression of the vascular structures um, related to this abnormality. In cases like this, um, where the symptoms kind of match the imaging findings right away, um, you can just get these folks referred to vascular surgery. This case was very interesting. Um, while he was getting worked up, kind of getting ready to go see vascular surgery, um, he had an acute worsening of his symptoms and ended up getting a CTA. Uh, so this is that right side, the, the side that we're interested in. Our images kind of go from proximal here um, to distal here. So proximally, we can see normal contrast filling of the popliteal artery. Here's our popliteal vein next door. As we come a little bit more distal, again, a more, uh, somewhat more normal looking artery, but we're starting to get a little flat. We can see that abnormal muscle starting to come into the view. Then as we go um, one slice farther down, boom, we've lost the contrast filling our popliteal artery. It's completely compressed by this accessory muscle. And we have to go um, kind of the midpoint or even a little distal to it to be able to see contrast uh, refilling that popliteal artery. So in this coronal image, here's our popliteal artery. There's our muscle. And you can see focal occlusion uh, of the vessel by this. This patient ended up having um, a couple of different rounds of surgery. They had to have a bypass graft and then ultimately had um, basically a decompression of their popliteal fossa with uh, unroofing of that muscle to hopefully prevent them from having thrombosis and occlusion in the future. All right, that is our, our developmental cases. We're going to do a few um, miscellaneous cases that didn't really fit into any other category. Uh, and then we'll have some time, hopefully, for some questions. All right, so here's our first miscellaneous case. So this is a 68-year-old with chronic knee pain. We'll have you click on the abnormality. All right, lots of consistency. I love the occasional outliers. Awesome. Okay, so this is a nice case of mucoid degeneration of the ACL. So what are our imaging findings here? So I have little arrows on either side of the ACL. Um, the ligament is um, expanded, particularly at its proximal aspect. We can still sort of make out uh, fibers and the fibers remain parallel to each other, but there's all this hyperintense signal. The fibers are hyperintense, there's hyperintense stuff all around them. Um, and like I said, the ligament itself is, is really quite enlarged. We don't see any focal disruption of the um, ligament fibers, importantly. Um, kind of mentioned this, you have some splaying of the fibers, but they're, um, you know, they all appear intact. The sign associated with mucoid degeneration of the ACL is that this is supposed to look like a celery stock um, appearance of the ligament. Um, we can have, this is a different patient with mucoid degeneration. Um, they kind of associated cruciate ligament cysts. So in this patient, at their kind of femoral attachment of their ACL, in addition to the expanded kind of splayed fibers, you have these little foci of um, cyst formation uh, along with that um, femoral attachment of the ligament. Um, and the expanded ligament in this case was thought to be symptomatic. Um, she actually went to surgery, and I don't think this projects super well, but the arrows here are kind of showing this globular stuff. It almost looks like like margarine or warm butter or something like that. And this is them kind of uh, squooshing out uh, the mucinous uh, material from within those cysts. Um, what causes mucodegeneration? Um, it may be related to trauma. It could just be something that certain people get as they age. Um, the key pitfall here is not to mistake it for an ACL tear or an ACL sprain. The expanded appearance of the ligament is kind of characteristic to help lead you towards mucodegeneration rather than a tear. 
Similarly, we wouldn't, we wouldn't expect to see any of our normal kind of contusion patterns we see with ACL injuries. Um, typically, these are going to be asymptomatic, but occasionally may cause some limited range of motion, and they may go in for a little bit of cyst debulking like this patient did. All right, um, this is a cute case. This is the same finding, but uh, this time in the posterior cruciate ligament. So again, you can see intact ligament fibers, but the ligament is huge and it's bright, and there's kind of all this proliferation of hyperintense stuff around the fibers. All right, miscellaneous case two. So this is a post-op case. A uh, 24 year old man who'd had a, uh, ACL reconstruction but has had ongoing pain and flexion and extension. All right, I love it. I didn't even have to direct you guys to the image to look at. Okay, we'll go ahead. So this is a case of an ACL reconstruction with arthrofibrosis. So the first image I was showing you is just a picture of that kind of normally aligned and intact ACL graft. And the second image, which is right next to it, shows this globular hypo-intense kind of heterogeneous stuff uh, in the anterior intercondylar notch sitting right up against that graft. Um, the typical uh, patient presentation um, for symptomatic patients with arthrofibrosis, they come in with pain, kind of limited range of motion and swelling. Uh, the, the MRI finding that we described, so this we talk about as arthrofibrosis, the more common kind of colloquial name of this is a cyclops lesion, which is named after the arthroscopic finding. I have an example of what that looks like. So this is this case. Uh, on the axial image, you can see just how kind of huge, rounded, um, uh, globular appearance of all of this scar tissue forming along the graft. Uh, and then a really nice uh, example of a cyclops that really does look um, like an eyeball sitting there in the knee joint. So pretty common. So um, apparently up to 25% of patients who have their ACL reconstructed can have some fibrosis at six months, but it's not always symptomatic. For symptomatic patients, um, the treatment is to go in and debride that scar tissue. All right, miscellaneous case three. So this is a 23-year-old who had an injury originally while uh, rock climbing and had some surgery for that. Um, and they're just undergoing follow-up. And the question here is, so I'll let you kind of look at these images, is which structure has been repaired? Oh, shoot. Okay. I don't think I realized that there was a none of the above. <laughs> that probably shouldn't be there. Go ahead and ignore the none of the above. All right, great. So this is a tough case. Um, many of you may not have actually seen this before, um, which is great. I'm excited to show you a case of this now. Um, so this is a case of a meniscal root repair. So what are our findings here? So um, we have this little endo button sitting on the anterior aspect of the proximal tibia. And then our two MRI images, they show the ACL, which looks intact. And I admit, I, I'm not showing you the normal PCL. So I totally understand um, people wondering if maybe we reconstructed the PCL here. Um, here's our little endo button. And you can see this super skinny little tunnel traversing obliquely towards the posterior aspect of the tibial plateau. And it comes out right underneath this posterior horn of the, um, of the lateral meniscus in this case. Um, so this is someone who had a meniscal root tear and had it repaired by the transtibial pull-out repair technique. This is now the favored approach to repairing um, posterior roots. Um, sometimes you'll also see kind of a, a, another approach, which is just using suture anchors to, to hold that repaired root um, into place. Um, I just wanted to show you the preoperative image in this case. So this is an axial um, showing you that little gap um, in the posterior uh, root where that root should be for this um, lateral meniscus. You can see um, there's the kind of retracted portion of the root. Uh, and then I have some arthroscopic images showing uh, the repair, which I just thought were, were really beautiful and, and showed um, how this is done. Uh, so this is the avulsed root. So here's our posterior horn coming in, the root, and our surgeon is kind of lifting up the root. You can see all this kind of globular scar tissue formation in here. So they, um, they free up the root from all the scar. Uh, and then they um, sort of lasso it or kind of bunch it together so that they have a good hold on it with their surgical sutures. They then drill that tunnel. And this is like a little skinny wire that is a guide wire that's drilled through the tibia. 
And then their final image, they basically take the, you know, kind of glommed up sutures in that posterior root and um, bury it into that tunnel and, and secure it to the anterior tibia um, using one of those endo buttons. So pretty slick, uh, really beautiful um, uh, arthroscopic images. And then the uh, imaging findings after this are pretty characteristic. So it's pretty unusual to have a tunnel this uh, tiny in caliber. If you think about our typical, you know, cruciate ligament repair or reconstruction tunnels, um, those tend to be a lot higher, um, a lot more uh, robust in terms of their caliber. So this thing is really, really skinny, just wide enough to let those sutures pass through. Um, okay, so that is that case. This is our last case. Um, so this is a marrow case. Um, I'm showing you coronal T1 images from four different patients. <laughs> And my question is, which of these T1-weighted images represents abnormal bone marrow? This is probably not a very hard case, but good one to, to discuss here. All right. So I'm seeing most people are concerned about this, this, this patient A. There's some other folks choosing D. Great. So um, the correct answer is A. Our A patient is um, someone with diffuse bone marrow replacement. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about normal bone marrow, which a lot of times is kind of an after afterthought on uh, knee imaging where we're worried about, you know, sports and trauma and all, all sorts of other things. Um, so our normal marrow on a T1 weighted sequence should be fat intensity, meaning there's a lot of yellow marrow or fatty marrow throughout the bone. Or if the patient does have a little bit of red marrow reconversion, that red marrow should still be hyperintense to skeletal muscle that we see on the same uh, exam. So here on this T1, you can see just how confluently dark our marrow is. And we have a couple of little skeletal muscles here to compare to. The marrow is clearly more hypointense than that skeletal muscle. Um, there's a pretty long differential diagnosis for diffuse marrow replacement. Um, things to think about would be a hematologic malignancy such as leukemia, a severe anemia can cause this, myelofibrosis, mastocytosis, osteopetrosis, and fluorosis are other causes. This case um, was a patient with, uh, with known thalassemia major. So this basically fits in that severe anemia uh, case. So thalassemia major patients have um, uh, kind of inborn errors in hemoglobin and end up with a severe anemia, uh, and their marrow just ramps up like crazy to try to compensate for that, um, and you get all of these kind of hematopoietic elements that proliferate in bone. Um, so here's a couple more images in this patient, the coronal T1 we already looked at, but look at just how abnormal it appears even on a T2 fat suppressed image, uh, and then all throughout the spine, you can see just how dark that marrow is even with respect to our intervertebral discs. This patient had a lot of other fun findings associated with thalassemia. So classically, these patients have a widened diploic space, um, basically trying to recruit any possible uh, location to create some more red blood cells. So in this case, we've um, increased the space in between our inner and outer tables. And we have a couple of little paraspinal masses that we can see uh, on this CT of the chest. So this is an example of extramedullary hematopoiesis. And then, oh, of course, there's also splenomegaly. So kind of a fun example of um, pretty horrendously abnormal marrow. Um, my last little point here, I just wanted to touch on red marrow reconversion because um, it's something we see very commonly um, really all throughout our MSK MRI cases, uh, but the knee, um, of course, is, is one place we see this a lot. So reconverted red marrow or hematopoietic elements that we see um, populating our bone, they should be isointense or hyperintense to skeletal muscle. So these are two cases. This was patients C and D in our, in our original question. You can see they do have, um, you know, clearly not fatty marrow, but the marrow that we're seeing in these metaphyses is still hyperintense with respect to our skeletal muscle. The patterns of red marrow reconversion that we can see, it can either be diffuse, like in these cases, or sometimes it can be patchy where it looks like little islands of red marrow. Um, classically, the epiphyses are spared, so we have nice fatty marrow in all of the imaged epiphyses in these cases. Contrast that to the entire replacement of the imaged marrow that we saw on our thalassemia case. Um, causes of red marrow reconversion, uh, living at high altitude, athletes, obesity, smokers, uh, and then anemia are, are causes for um, reconverting red marrow. Here in Utah, Pretty much everyone falls into one of these categories, and so it's something we see all the time. We tend, you know, tend not to even really mention it um, in most cases, as it's just a normal finding and pretty ubiquitous in our patient population. All right, so that is my last case. Uh, I just wanted to include a couple of of points and takeaways here. Uh, so <laughs> this. 
This is how I feel about Nehemiah. Uh, every day that you get to read a Nehemiah is a good day. Um, it's a fabulous joint and a lot of fun um, pathology that we can see in the knee. Um, like anywhere else in MSK, imaging knowledge of anatomy and variations of normal is key. So I, I, I think you know being familiar with some of those uh, normal variants uh, and pitfalls in terms of what's a real you know, pathologic diagnosis and what's a variant is really, really helpful in terms of interpreting the knee. Um, clinical history is essential. Um, you know, it's good to always be asking, what is the bone marrow telling you? That's why I like to, to include those kind of mechanism of injury cases uh, to see, you know, our patterns of contusions can tell us something about what kind of injury the patient had and to look for certain injuries or certain um, uh, torn ligaments or, or menisci or whatever um, that we see associated with that. Uh, and then my last uh, thing I wanted to say is, you know, radiology residency is hard. Um, you guys work really hard uh, at what you do. And I just want to share that at the end of it, uh, there really is a, a wonderful career. Being a radiologist is, has been great uh, and you can and will uh, make a positive impact on your patients. Here are some references. And I just wanted to include a gratuitous picture of beautiful Bryce Canyon National Park, which is just a few hours outside of Salt Lake here in Utah. It'd be great to take some. All right, I see a couple of that's awesome. Uh, huge, massive, gargantuan thank you to Dr. Haley Allen uh, and all of you in the audience for taking part in this terrific presentation. Uh, for the audience, please complete the evaluation uh, by clicking in the link in the chat to give us feedback on the webinar. And we're getting towards the top of the hour. I don't see any questions. I think that Dr. Allen has answered all my questions that I had <laughs> about MRI of the knee. And uh, I especially like the take-home point that every day you get to read a knee MRI is a good day. <laughs> so um, we'll look one more time for any questions. Uh, I think we're good. We're almost at the top of the hour. So we will thank you and give a plug for the next SSR lecture. It'll be on November 15th at 7 p.m. Eastern, Interesting Elbow Cases, presented by Dr. Christian Jeanette. Uh, and we hope to see you all then. In the meantime, thank you and uh, have a great evening. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone.